So I'm going to talk really about the, the, uh, the process that I went through uh, with colleagues to design this building. Um, so there'll be construction shots, there'll be construction uh, drawings, there'll be final uh, professional uh, photographs, there'll be little sketches that I did, there'll be lots of different things. So just to touch a bit on myself, um, I've been at Vernon Johnson, like Anna said, for about 19 years, and we do specialize in cultural buildings, mainly museums. Uh, here's a list of some of the projects that I've worked on. Um, Donna mentioned the Tampa Bay History Center. This opened in 2009. This was my first uh, design, my first building, really, uh, a freestanding new building, a new museum uh, that focused on the regional history of Tampa Bay. It's, it's downtown. As some of you might know, the Flint Hills Discovery Center in Manhattan, Kansas. This was my second building. <laughs> um, uh, and this focuses on um, telling the story of the uh, Tall Grass Prairie, uh, specifically the Kansas Prairie, the Flint Hills. So let's focus on the Museum of Prairie Fire. Um, so I'm going to choose this as a starting point. I don't know if any of you know either of these buildings. The one on the left is the Carnegie Museums of Pittsburgh. It's from 1905. It's a Beaux-Arts building, uh, very traditional. It's, it's, it's a lovely building. And the one on the right is Miss Van der Rohe's uh, Barcelona Pavilion from 1929. And why I'm showing you these is um, because when I first met, met Fred and, and Candy, um, what, what I thought this project should be about was um, a, a, a building that was inspirational, that told a story, told a story about uh, this, this place, a story that was specific to, to Kansas. And to me, these buildings, even though I think they're lovely buildings, especially the Mies, it's an amazing building, they, do, they don't, in my mind, they're more um, they talk more about ideology, more about what architecture can and, and should do, that they could be anywhere, and we've seen them everywhere. In Paris, we've seen them in New York. Um, houses like Mises houses are all over California. So I started thinking about kind of regional design that, um, um, because of many of the projects that I've done, that I've done were regional museums. Um, so the, this, the Flint Hills Discovery Center, for instance, again, it, it talks about the Flint Hills. Um, the building itself uh, tries to evoke the story of it. The, the, this area was an inland sea 85 million years ago, so the limestone on the face of the building shows the striations and deposits of limestone. The cylinder is trying to evoke imagery of the wind and water that, that shaped the Flint Hills. So that, that was a starting point. Now, for, for the Museum of Prairie Fire, um, we were asked to develop a few concepts. The fire was the first one that came to mind. Right, right away it came to mind. Uh, another one uh, was water, that, that Fred specifically asked us to look into kind of water management, um, ecosystems. And then another one that I thought was topography, flying over the Flint Hills, Kansas. Uh, the topography is just stunning as a, as a graphic. So thinking about how maybe that could be um, kind of applied to the face of the building. But the one we all really liked the most, they liked all of them, but the one they really liked the most was fire. And why that came to mind, um, when I was working on the Flint Hills Discovery Center, I went there monthly, and in the spring, uh, during one of my trips, I saw the burns, and I was just so amazed, I had never seen anything like it coming from New England, that people would intentionally burn the ground uh, to maintain a specific type of landscape. Um, the other thought was buildings really aren't supposed to evoke fire, so, uh, <laughs> for life safety reasons, so I didn't know of any building that did. So I thought it was a completely unique concept um, that you want to celebrate fire in a building. And 
so it, it's, it, to me it was the most intriguing story that was unique to this region. And here are some boards that we did showing kind of uh, massing the way the plan might work out, imagery of the Flint Hills, and imagery of materials that I knew, which I'll get to later. And then some expressions, iridescent, glowing, vibrant, animated, contrasted, that, you know, that's what I think of when I think of fire. So the idea was that the building would do the same thing. So materials are a huge part of this, of this design. And I, I, knew these, I knew the materials that I wanted to use. I had samples of them. I thought they were just amazing materials that really could evoke fire. Um, so these are some of the, um, the big points about the design, why they liked it so much. Another one was that the, the overall development is in a kind of a, a grid. It follows 135th Street and all. The idea was that the museum would be part of the wetlands. It would be more of a special feature, a little more freeform, and that it would engage with the, with the wetlands. <coughs> Now the, the other thing um, about design, and you may think that this building was designed from the outside in, but it was actually really designed from the inside out. And that's the way I typically design, because buildings are inhabited on the inside. I mean, they're both important, obviously, but the inside experience should be as dramatic as the outside. It should be as uh, spiritual, evocative, um, so, one of the, the um, concepts for this, uh, for this building, um, well, one of the main programs is, are the traveling exhibits right there. As you know, traveling exhibits from the American Museum of Natural History. Now, I've been to many museums, many traveling exhibits, and the way many museums work is you go in, you're immersed in this environment here in India, you're discovering about the horse or the brain or, or dinosaurs, and all of a sudden you're dumped out into a gift shop, or you're dumped out back into the lobby, or into a corridor, you don't know where you are. And to me, that, that kind of kills the experience. Um, your whole visit should start outside, should continue throughout, you know, while you're in here, and you should still be kind of in a high as you leave. It should still, it should, it should be a cost but your whole, you know, the whole, your whole visit. So here the idea was when you exit the traveling exhibits, you'd have a bit of a journey back to the, um, back to the lobby. Uh, facing the wetlands, it would be a little more intimate, and it would, you can kind of see it, um, it, it gets bigger. So it starts small, a little more intimate, you have time to adjust. Um, another interior kind of planning um, issue that I thought was important was the other main uh, program area, which is the discovery room. Um, I, I wanted kids to feel like they had their own special place. Um, it, it's, it's the other big exhibit. So I wanted it to be off in a, in a building by itself, in a way. And this building really is two buildings. That building and this building. And then these lines of fire that connect them. So, um, that that was part of the original design with this bridge that connects the two and this and the exterior balcony which is unique to the discovery room so now i'm going to talk a lot about the design you come up with a concept great how do you create a building out of it there's lots of components to a building and to me I had this, we had this concept that I loved, fire. And the idea was that the approach to, to every element of design would be based on trying to evoke that concept. And it really meant to be developing languages for, for windows, for, uh, for doors, for rooms, for ceilings, based on this notion of trying to evoke fire. So starting with the plan concept, so you want to evoke fire. What does that mean? What does fire do? It, it can, it, 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 um, it's fascinating, right? It draws you in and it, and it can also embrace you and encircles you. And that's the way, um, this was the first sketch I did for the, for the building. Um, 
that that was how I approached how this building would lay out and plan. And you can see that here. There are two, um, I can't point, unfortunately, but there are the two big blocks you can see. To the left is the first floor plan. And then there's a morphic shape that connects them. And that's the fiber surrounding both, both of those forms, kind of engulfing them. And the two blocks are stone blocks, and the, the free form are the fire elements. Um, so the idea is that the blocks would be solid blocks. They, they would evoke kind of the soft, distant uh, prairie forms that you see when driving through the prairie. You know, you see these, these soft hills kind of overlapping one another. It, it's beautiful, and they're gently shaped, eroded by time. Um, and that was the idea behind these, these stone boxes, that they, they, would, they would do the same thing. And there were some sketches kind of studying that. And here you can see it here, especially in this photo, those, those gentle, curved forms of uh, the stone volumes. And then for the fire elements, fire is animated, right? It, it, your, your eye is never at rest when you look at fire. So that was the idea behind designing these walls, that there would be shapes within shapes within shapes, and it would just always appear animated. And here, like I mentioned, there are some construction drawings to show you. I mean, I'd like for you to kind of understand architecture, you know, there's a reality to it. You gotta draw things. If you want something built, you gotta draw it so that they can build it. So um, it's a challenge, but if you enjoy it, it's actually fun. <laughs> and here this shows those um, those shapes within shapes. The walls have shapes, but then the glass within the walls have different shapes. And then there are two different types of glass. So the, the, the bottom, the dark, is this, this vision glass. And then the, the colored glass is the dichroic glass, and I'll, and I'll get to that. So I'd like to, to go a little more depth into materials. So I have this idea for there's stone volumes, then there are these fire elements. So then how do you develop the, you know, this idea of stone volumes, prairie forms? And again, going back to the idea of fire, I thought, well, if you're burning the ground, then maybe some of the stone is charred on the bottom. Um, so the idea was to create this gradient um, from dark, like a charcoal color, through reds and browns. And these are colors that you see in a cup through the Flint, through the Flint Hills up to um, near white at the top, which I, which I felt would make it feel softer. <clears throat> so there are actually 10 different types of stone. Five of them are natural Kansas limestone, and five of them are an engineered product. And, and there are a couple of reasons for that. Um, natural Kansas limestone only comes in certain colors. It only comes in the lighter colors, which you saw at the time. Discovery Center. So to achieve this idea of gradient, I needed to find other stones. Um, why I went to an engineer product, there are a couple of reasons. First, um, the, one of the landscape concepts for the building was that these stone volumes would, would be buried in the ground. Um, the, the, the landscaping around them would slope up to them and to make the form seem more embedded in the ground as opposed to just sitting on the ground. And I, and I thought that, that was a wonderful idea. And if you walk around there, especially that whole volume, you can see that. I mean, the ground comes up almost five feet in some areas. So a lot of it is buried. Here I'm just showing you, um, again, kind of touching on the reality of the world of architecture and construction. On the left was kind of the original pass at it. And, and to me, this is what I think, when I say development of a language, this is kind of what I'm talking about. I have a concept to develop a, a gradient in stone. Well, how do I do that? You know, sometimes, some passes up it, at it, it's successful, others not. So this was the first pass. We had some budgetary constraints. We had some constructability issues. I was mixing. Um, too many stones, um, which increased labor costs. 
and I was mixing natural stone with engineered stone, uh, which don't have the same absorption rates ne necessarily, so that wasn't recommended either. So I took another pass at it, which is what's, what's on the building and what's here on the right, um, separating the two, um, having more of the natural Kansas limestone, and only mixing two different stones per band. So again, how do you, okay, so I have this idea of mixing stones and how, how do I convey this information so it can be built the way I, I, I want it to be built? So this, this was our uh, kind of our bonding pattern elevation. And what I did was I broke the uh, stone, I divided the stone elevation into bands that had a, um, uh, two stones per band. They were a specific size, there was a specific number of courses, which is, you know, laying out one whole line of stone. And uh, the Masons got it. They understood what I wanted to achieve. And the way we mixed the stone was saying, okay, in band 13, there's 50% of this stone, 50% of that. Band 14, there's 75% of this stone, 25% of that stone. Um, I think it worked out pretty well, but to get to that <laughs> takes a while. You know, you go through several iterations. And this just shows some more construction documents of how we laid out the curves and, and, and windows and, and things like that. And then looking at looking at windows, they call them kind of punch windows. This this is more of a window wall. Uh, most of the wall is window, whereas punch windows, it's a single window. So here we have this idea of, you know, prairie forms. Well, you're not just going to put any old window in it. You're going you're gonna to develop a window language that works with the concept of fire. So for here, it was this notion of flickers or like little flames of a candle. And all of these windows, none, no two are alike. I, and again, that's kind of the idea that it's movement and it's, it's random. And here's some more construction photos kind of showing and the same with the exterior doors. Um, you know, shaping windows, why not shape doors? Which, you know, brought challenges. Of, uh, <laughs> uh, hard very had a, but we, it worked out well. We had to see a couple of doors depending on the side of the hinge. The cranks had to be notched a little bit, but it worked out. So that's kind of an overview of the stone volumes. Now I want to talk about these, call them, I always call them lines of fire. So my understanding was fire in the prairie was set originally with like a, a horse drawing a, a, a flame. So the, this material, this dichroic glass, it's, it's not stained glass, it's dichroic glass. The, the, um, the color, the pattern, all of that is a film that is laminated between two thin sheets of glass. And that forms the outer light of an insulated glazing unit because it's performance glass. It, this has to perform. Um, it has to let in light but not let in heat energy. And it performs actually pretty well. Um, it's a 3M film. I, I knew about the film and I knew about other dichroic glass. Um, actually, let, let me, let, well, let me talk about it since we're here. Um, there, there are different types of dichroic glass. Um, there, are, there are dichroic glass where the glass itself is dichroic, and I don't completely understand the, the process, but um, to me it didn't have the same effect. It, it didn't really work within the budget, and the company wasn't being very responsive. So I, I approached three different companies in North America, and one was very responsive, and they helped develop this, this insulated glazing unit with dichroic film, which had never been done as far as we know in North America. So this really is the first building in North America to, to have this, to have a product like that as exterior windows. And you can see it, it, it's amazing. It, depending on the viewing angle and the light hitting it, it appears different colors on the outside, from red, orange, yellow, to almost a light green. Um, also, you can see in the image to the left, when you're close to it and you look up, it, it has a gradient itself from red to orange to, to, um, to yellow. So I, I, 
to me, it, it, I can't think of another product that could evoke fire <laughs> as well as this product does. The, the other interesting thing is it transmits light differently. The color spectrum is different. It, it's blues and purples. And, and I'll, I'll get to what I, how I dealt with that. So, so going back to these walls, again, these, these forms within forms, uh, you can see here, uh, this wall is actually um, that wall right there on the outside. This is how it was documented. It was unfolded. Every mullion was dimensioned. <laughs> um, and the idea is that nothing lines up. Because to me, if you start lining up things, your eye picks it up, even subconsciously, and there's a kind of a, uh, a restfulness that sets in. You get it and you move on. If nothing lines up, you're, you're just looking for that rest, and you don't find it. So to me, it, it made it more animated. And it, it just, so the white is all the metal panel, the, the dark color is this vision glass, and the, the mid-gray is the dichroic glass. <clears throat> now, these lines of fire, to me, fire is ephemeral. Ephemeral. It's a, it's a gas, really. It's 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 um, it has almost no substance at all. So I, I wanted the walls to be as thin as possible. Now, at the Flint Hills Discovery Center and the Tampa Bay History Center, they have big window walls too. And the way that's often achieved is you have a structure that holds up the roof, and then you have a curtain wall or glazing system um, that's independent, but that's braced back to it. Um, I didn't want to do that here. It, having columns, you know, it, it, it wouldn't have had the same effect. I, I don't think you would have read the, the intent that I was trying to achieve. So I was hoping to combine those into a single system that the wall would support, the walls would support the roof, but also that's what you would connect the glass to. So I approached a company that made stainless steel mullions. Most mullions, which are the window, you know, with the windows that the glass is attached to, um, are aluminum. Um, you know, steel is, is more structural. Um, they were started to be mildly interested, and they weren't. They they got a little scared. So I thought, okay, if <laughs> if I want to make this happen, I have to figure it out myself. So here are some details, and they know they're. Can't really read them, but the idea is to use the idea that I came up with was to use standard steel sections. These come out of a book, really. You can find them in a book. They're proper reason to are in a book. Um, steel tubes and steel channels welded to one another, and these are, are frames. And you you can see the image on the right is a photo of that wall right there. So even behind the drywall areas. Those verticals continue all the way up to the roof, and they and they support the roof beams. And the glass system, there's a glass system, it's called a veneer system, where instead of having like a chunky window frame, you know, behind the glass, you, you don't you don't need it because these these right here, this is your mullion too, right? So the glass is just veneered almost directly on it, just a thin aluminum plate. Uh, with silicone sealant, and and to me it really it it achieved the effect that I that I that I wanted. And and here it is on the, the outside again, sort of sort of the, the forms within the forms. No rust for the eye, and you, I mean you're experiencing this now. But you can see on the right, imagine columns in front of that window. It, it, it would not have looked the same. It would not have been the same experience. The, the, these walls look almost paper thin in this photo. So the, the other element, there's the glass on these walls, and there are the shapes. The other element is the, the metal panel. And I knew of this product, it's uh, called Light Interference Color Stainless Steel. And it's a very interesting product, because it also slightly changes color depending on your viewing angle. And it, it's actually not a colored panel. Um, st it's stainless steel, and stainless steel naturally has a layer of, uh, I believe it's called chromium dioxide, um, um, that 
an actual, like a microscopic layer of it. But this company, Millennium Forms in Wisconsin, what they do is they grow that layer of chromium dioxide to different depths. And what that does is it refracts and reflects light differently. So the color that you're seeing it is not like a paint or anything like that. It's just the way the light is, is reflecting from the material. So it, it's a fascinating material. And you'll see some colors change more than others, but some can go from purple to, to green to blue just as you walk around them. And I call this a painterly approach, because again, I, so I have this idea of you know, developing the, these flames, right? So I, and, and de developing, it with, again, the notion of a gradient. When you look at frames, in, uh, flames, even in a cartoon way, you think of blue darker at the bottom, lighter at the top. Um, and I think that has to do with the intensity of the heat. Um, so that's what, I, that's what I wanted to do here. Um, but I, I didn't want to do it in a regular way. Again, I wanted to do it in, uh, in, in a way that was random, kind of like the way fire is. So we laid out all of these panels on, on drawings. There are over 10,000 panels in, in this building of those panels. We laid them out. <laughs> so I drove a colleague crazy. <laughs> Because the idea was that you'd have bursts, you'd have, you can see little ones floating, like little sparks breaking off, you know. And again, it was developing a language, which colors work against each other. What were the shapes of these sparks? Some shapes look bad, others look good. And so it, it took time to develop the language of the metal panels. And here, you, you, you can see it here. And, and, and how they relate to the, the shape of the walls, and how they relate to the shapes of the glass. It, it, there are endless possibilities, so um, we worked hard on this until I was happy with it. <laughs> now there are a few more things on, on the exterior. There's also these terrace walls, the, the idea, to me, like I said, your experience should start across the street. Before you get into the building, your experience of the museum should start out there. And one way of doing that is the building engages with the with the outside. And so I knew that I wanted to have these terraces. And the idea was that these walls were kind of uh, lines of fire that had died down to embers. So you can kind of kind of see that here. Um, this is how we drew them all up again, kind of taking these. Peaks and, and valley shapes, and the idea was that some of them would be illuminated, you know, up, uplit with kind of twinkling lights, lights, so that they would look like they're kind of smoldering, but also that they would be, it would be fun. Kids would want to sit on them, walk around them. You know, I, I think it's important for people to physic, for for people to feel that a building is theirs in a way. It's part of their community. They have to be able to engage with it. If it's this thing they can't touch, then I don't think they're going to engage with it. It's so precious. But here, kids can walk on the walls. They can stand between the, the columns. They can, have, they can have fun here. On the inside, again, going back to the idea of fire, I knew there would be big openings um, into the store, into the, into the cafe. You want those to be visible spaces in the museum. You want people to know where they're going. Uh, at Werner Johnson, we like people to understand how a building is laid out without really having to look at a map or having to read all these signs. Um, and for these openings, I thought, well, what if they appear like maybe they were charred? It was a material that was burned, and, and this was the resultant shape. So that's that's kind of how we developed these. And we used a, a, a 3D program um, to, 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 to work through it. And you can see them here, the whole other side of the bridge. And then often, inside forms, um, they, you know, have a, a have a um, impact on outside forms, vice vice versa. Languages cross in from inside and out. So uh, I was kind of thinking of this 
this balcony, which I, I, I felt was an important feature, because the discovery room is an important component of this museum, and I think you people should know that it's up there and that it's a special place. And, it, and um, the, this balcony that, that was part of the design, part of it was also to create an area of control ceilings. Um, again, I wanted the ceilings, the concept is fire. What, what do you do with ceilings that, that works with that concept? And smoke came to mind. I mean, I think whatever comes to mind naturally, go with it, work with it, um, develop it. So the idea is that it's smoke, it's kind of gently swirling, swirling smoke. The color, the steel, um, steel didn't have to be this way. <laughs> it was designed. It's all, it's all intentional. Um, and here, here you can see uh, some of the tools that we use. Uh, the Cowan Board uh, developed this um, uh, program that showed the steel frames. You can see the walls, they're all, they're all structural. And then these, these roof beams. And then the shapes that they create on the outside. This, these are the, the, the uh, roof right above here. That, that Peak. And that's me. And uh, I, I think it, I think it comes together. <laughs> and then for these other, uh, what we call kind of other visitor services spaces in the lingo, cafe, store. Um, why just have okay a, a, a dumb store? You know, why not? Why not have it in it a little bit? You know, make it work with the rest of the design. So the idea here was to create a feature in those spaces of, of smoke. I'm sorry that the photos are very good here, but you know, smoke coming off the wall and pooling on the ceiling, and then integrating your your HVAC, your diffusers, your lighting, your um, other systems into it. And then, and then I and then the floor right here. Um, I knew. Uh, we started talking about doing terrazzo, which is very popular, you know, colorful and everything. Um, I was kind of tired of doing terrazzo <laughs> and shapes, and it's a little cartoony, designy. Um, for this building, I felt that stone really was, was a better choice, and I think it's a beautiful stone. And so, again, keeping in the concept of, of fire and um, one element, one design element impacting another. Um, here, you can see on the bottom right is kind of the bonding pattern for the floor. And the idea was that it would be a, kind of similar to the stone on the outside of the building. There'd be different size pieces, um, random lengths, you know, a little offset. Um, but then also that there'd be this gradient uh, like the stone. So the, where it hits the lines of fire, it's the dark charcoal color. Then where it comes in a bit, it's a, it's a lighter gray. And then in the middle, kind of between that line, of, those lines of fire and this, this line of fire, it's green because the fire hasn't gotten to it yet. So um, that was kind of the impetus for that. And you can see it, it's, it's best seen from above. Um, and then just to touch in a few slides on um, what museums are about. And what this museum is about, it's a community hub. It's, it's kind of, it's open to all. It's for you to come and gather for lots of different events. And, and you come here for educational purposes as well, whether as an adult, as kids for at school, seeing these amazing um, traveling exhibits developed by American Museum of Natural History in New York. It's an event space. There have been some great parties in this space, whether they're small cocktail parties, weddings, um, or galas. And the outside terraces are meant to be for the, for the same reason. <clears throat> and then going back to the, the original idea of um, telling a story about the place, um, this is what I think it does. It helps the community um, define itself or have an image of what it's about. Um, and that's why I think, I think architecture can be very important if it's done the right way. So hopefully, I think this building does that. It creates this sense of civic identity. And that's
that's what I have to say. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Sure. Uh, you know, White Castle tried to build something here a few years ago. It didn't be right. It didn't hold them apart. Uh -huh. How did you get this past the city? <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, okay. Uh, the first concept, I believe, was in February, 
and I believe it broke ground in December of that same year or in January of the following year. It was pretty fast. It was pretty fast. It was um, a slow start, and then the schedule was accelerated. So, and it was broken down to accelerate it even further. We started some scopes like steel, like preparing the ground, and, and steel. There was a steel package that went in. There was an exterior package and then an interior package. Um, and then throughout, throughout construction, um, you know, some things still had to be developed. I, I didn't have time to work out the, um, the paint by number really um, diagrams for the metal panel elevations. I mean, I have the, the, the colors, but it wasn't worked out. So, you know, a lot of, several things had to be worked out later in, in a timely way <laughs> so that it was done in time for them to order the material to, to, and all that. But um, it was tight, it was fast. Yes. Can you describe how you, in your vision, when I'm looking at that picture behind you, the lighting, and how did you decide and what kind of lighting did you use to enhance your vision as, as darkness came on in, in the interior? Right, well, lighting is so important, and um, I'm, I'm very attuned to lighting. Um, we have a lighting designer. On um, every project, we have a lighting designer. Um, I actually have a lot of input in the, for the lighting in this project. Um, the lighting in the lobby, for instance, I wanted it to kind of go away. I didn't, um, originally, they, they thought of having pendants in here, and so I, I don't want to see anything in the ceiling. So I, I came up with this idea of, of a slot with, with track, um, you know, to put lighting in. For the exterior, we wanted to, to kind of animate um, the, the, you know, the exterior with you know, LED, you, you can animate it very easily. Um, it's not always so easy to program, but <laughs> as we've discovered, but um, we, we wanted to animate it and um, create almost like a couple of different shows. In the interior, there, there are <coughs> different settings that have different lighting effects. So, for instance, in the evening, one of the settings is kind of a red tone, so it gives the gray, um, this red ember, ember kind of kind of look. Um, so we did want to create features, and these walls over here, they have this kind of gently, um, you know, movement light, like like flames um, going up. Were there any city codes that had come in, John? City codes that were challenging. Um, I don't recall any that were particularly challenging. They're, they're, um, I, 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 I don't really. We, we had a big, um, we, this building was supposed to have a geothermal system. It, it, it's not really answering your question, but in terms of surprise or challenges. Um, we designed with a geothermal system with geothermal wells. Well, they hit um, natural gas pockets. So we, we had to abandon um, that system and redesign, redesign, you know, for another system. So I'd say that was probably the biggest challenge. Also, there were other things too. Let's say um, exhibit designers came on quite late. So coordinating that, all of that, they had a very short time frame, and I think they did an amazing job um, to, to, to design and to build the, the exhibits in the discovery room and then the exhibits out here. Yes? I think it's a volunteer breeder here, yes. and I always try to draw their attention to the building. I have about a minute's time to do that. What would you tell people? <laughs> what would I tell people? That's a good question. That's a good question. <laughs> well, um, I, I think, uh, <laughs> well, the story, I think, that the building, the imagery of the building is, is trying to evoke the uh, prairie fire burns if, if, if they don't get it. And, um, you know, that the, 
the, the big boxes are kind of these soft, um, like distant, furry vista forms, and that these these walls are lines of fire that would you know create the burns. And then maybe I touch on just the um, the uniqueness of the materials, especially in these walls. Um, you know that the dichroic. This really is its first application, like I said, that we know of in, in the U.S. and how unique a product it is. Sure. Is our is our so our dichroic glass is unique in New York, but only can see. No, as as far as I know, the only building in North America that has it as exterior glazing. I've seen it as decorative glass, <coughs> like fins on a building. It's been used in interior applications, but used in a, a performance a performance application. And when I when I say performance, um, like I said, the, the, this glass um, first of all it reduces the amount of sunlight coming in. It, it blocks out heat transfer. Um, there are terms U value. Um, Shading coefficient. These are these are glazing terms, and we had a target, and and the glass was designed to meet that that target. I I don't know. From from what I hear, 3M developed the film. Um, for what specific purpose, I don't know. And, yes. When you build something like this, do you personally go back when it's done and evaluate it for yourself that will inform future building? I did. I did. I um, I sat down with my colleagues and I said I really want to learn from this. Um, and it's something we hadn't done, and I don't know why, but let's just brainstorm what went right, what, what was a struggle, you know, what, what can we do better, you can always do better. Um, and, and so I have like a 10 page list of, and it's not just architecture, it's mechanical, it's lighting, it's, land, it's landscape, everything. Um, it's, it's procedural stuff as well as design stuff, everything that we can think of. And, um, and I have that, and going to the next project, you know, I plan on, plan on using it. I've already used some of it. Um, you know, well, what's, what's ideal? You can't always have the ideal, right? There's not a budget or there's not a room or, or whatever, but, um, but I'm very proud of this building because I think from the Tampa Bay History Center, two buildings later to this, I think I've come a long way. <laughs> I'd probably say that's been more my, my biggest inspiration. 
And then, to be honest, on this project, um, you know, in your career, you can get more confidence, and and um, and I just okay, this is what I want to do, and let's see if I can make it happen. Let's see if I can make, make you know the client happy, and if I can keep it in budget, and if I can figure out how to build it so that you know and and convey the information so that they can build it. Um, so. Uh, Sure where I was going with that, but <laughs> it's uh, it's um, it, it was a big leap. This this building was a big leap for me because I finally felt okay. I'm, I'm doing it. I'm going to figure it out. And I wasn't at that point with the, the first two projects. Who was the client? The client was uh, a Merrill Companies. Fred, Fred Merrill's right, right here, <laughs> who uh, developed all of Prairie Fire. Well, I, yeah. And uh, Fred knew of the um, Flint Hills Discovery Center, and uh, he liked it a lot. He and Candy liked it a lot. And um, I said to him, well, I want to try to do better. <laughs> Right angles, like 90 degree angles. Is that to keep your eye continuing to seek and hunt through the, in that different places, or? It, it, it's to me, um, there are actually two 90 degree angles inside. There's one right there and there's one right there. They're kind of facing each other. Okay. And um, to me, there are. I, I like sculpting space. Um, it's making it more fluid. Um, and then when you use a right angle, it's for a specific reason. <laughs> I mean, why do you have to start with a right angle, right? Um, so that that's kind of my starting point. I, I just think it, it flows. It, it has a flow to it. It has more of a softness to it. Or, or maybe it's more angular. Um, it, it depends on what the intent is. So, I mean, and, and, and you're right, it, it, it's to be more natural in a way. I don't think fire is contained in, in, to specific, in specific geometries. I mean, I don't really know the physics of it, but um, I wouldn't think that it would be. So it's, it's, it's playing off of that. And, I'm sure. You want people to interact with the ability to look out yeah. the yeah. For the last 30 minutes, everyone's been taking photos. So I think you're confident. Um, again, just want to congratulate you on, on an incredible job. But I think one of the things that, that people don't always understand is you can come up with an incredible design, but you still have to execute. Right. And, and, and I think one of the great uh, attributes of a great architect is someone who can have the great design but can then be workable and, and make it work with the contractor and execute what that is. And um, just for everyone's knowledge, the, the senior project manager with McCown Gordon who actually built this building right. is Michael Reardon standing right back right there. there.
Well, let us thank him, please, and enjoy.